Revelations chapter 2. Verse, I guess I'll start with verse 12 to get a complete thought. Still dealing with the church at Pergamum or Pergamos. To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works. Where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them. We preached about that Thursday night from this particular phrase. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to, to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing their doctrine, Jesus says, I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, to the one who prevails, to the person who puts those things that the Lord has spoken against behind them, will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone. And in the stone, a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving or except he that received it. For your consideration, verse 17, the B clause says, to him that overcometh. Talking to those people who, for reasons of their own, strayed away. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name. I want to preach today hidden manna. White stone and a new name. Or better, repent and accept the Lord's generous offer. He's offering hidden manna, a white stone and a new name. Bless us now, Lord, as we preach, teach, the word of the Lord today, in Jesus' name, amen. This may be the last message that I will preach, teach, uh, for now, concerning the tempted church, or the church that was nicknamed the tolerant church, the church at Pergamum. Church at Pergamum. Uh, had a reputation for being a church of diversity. And their diversity is what got them in trouble with God. You know, we're living in a day now where uh, if you listen to uh, the wicked, they will make you think that the solution to everything is diversity. 
say diversity has done this and diversity has done that. And the way they use the word diversity, you have to understand language now. The, the word mongrels are saying things to you uh, without saying them. Diversity now literally means just make sure you include and do not disagree with and go along with, no matter what, the LGBTQ community. That's what diversity means. Include us, and we are right. You know, Kevin Spacey is in trouble, not because he raped a boy. They could care less about that. They're dropping him because of what he, that he brought uh, shame on the shameful LGBTQ community. It is shameful. God calls it an abomination. I still agree with God. Amen. I still agree with the Bible. The Bible hasn't changed, so neither have I, and we're going to go along with the Bible. Say amen. Where's love in that? The most loving thing you can do is tell the truth. All right. So since God hadn't changed, then uh, nothing has changed. The Bible is right. Right? So uh, the code is, the code now is diversity. And the church at Pergamos was called the diverse, the tolerant church. So this may be my last message talking about them today. Say amen. Now, by the way of review, uh, we learn that the church at Pergamum was indeed a divided church. There were three competing and contrasting sects, three competing and contrasting uh, ideologies in the church at Pergamum. Praise the Lord. And and these three groups called the, called the church to be commended by the Lord and to be condemned by the Lord. Amen. See, the church at Pergamos was condemned by the Lord for the things that it condoned. Now, this won't shout you this part of the, of the message. This is not a this, this is this this part of the message is 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 awfully and woefully yesterday. But God still has a standard. I told you it was yesterday, old school. God still has a standard. And 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 he expects his standard to be upheld. The church at Corinth um had a lot of good things. There was a lot of good things about it, but there were things going on at Corinth that was out of order. One of the things, it was, and listen, it wasn't uh, just what was done was happening. Now listen to me. But it was the people's attitude toward what was happening. Bible says in Corinth, there was a man there who had his father's wife. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 says, It is commonly reported, it is, common, it is reported commonly that there is fornication, pornea, among you. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles. Said, now that's fornication, it's bad enough. Said, but you guys have set a new law. Said, the Gentile, don't even holler do this. What, what was going on? That one should have his, and the word there, have his, literally means to marry. To have married his father's wife. There was a man in Corinth who married his stepmother. His father possibly had died. We don't know what happened to his father. We know this, he was out. And uh, the, the stepson was in. Now you, you, you know that's bad. <laughs> Somebody said behind me, that's just nasty. Now, that was one of the things that was wrong. 
But then let's notice something else that was wrong with the church. And he said to the members who didn't have their father's wife, the rest of the folk who were married to who they should have been married to, or not married at all, he said, and you are puffed up. That is, you are arrogant. You're not bothered by this guy sitting in church, married to his father's wife. See, See God judges us for what we condone, what we allow. So you don't have to be guilty of doing it, but if you're in a position of authority, and you allow it. You get in trouble with God for that. All these churches with, the, with the, this wickedness going on. And the, the, you have the, 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 the choir director. The male is like a woman. And you, 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 you have wicked folk. An immoral person singing on the choir. Serving in the church. And you know it. Now it's one thing if you don't know. And you know it. And you never say anything. You condone it. You know it, but you won't do anything about it. Even though you personally may not participate in it. So there was no record uh, that anybody had their stepmother but this one guy. But the whole church got rebuked for it. He says, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned. Some things ought to break your heart. Well, it, you know, it's not my business, so I just keep my nose out of other people's business. You have not rather mourned. Well, that's my friend, and I don't judge my friend. You have not rather mourned. That he that have done this deed might be taken from among you. For I verily judge as absent in body. Paul said, I'm not even there. But present in spirit have judged already. Here's the conclusion I come to. As though I were present with you concerning him that have, that have uh, so done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you are gathered together in my spirit, Paul is saying God's spirit, in his spirit, the spirit of the leader, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the body or the, or the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. That is, excommunicate that person. If they don't give up, if they don't come out, if they don't quit, meet with them first. But if they don't give it up, uh, give her up in this, put them out to church. Right. Don't call them and have secret phone calls with them trying to encourage them. I, I don't believe that the pastor was right. He was too mean. He shouldn't have done that. No, no. Let them suffer uh, hoping that they will see the wickedness of their ways, repent of their sins, and come back. And by the way, the church at Corinth obeyed Paul. They put the man out, and guess what he did? He saw the wickedness of his way and repented and ended up getting right. It worked, but it only worked because they wouldn't condone it. You can't correct what you caught them. Say amen. So the Pergamos church Let's take a look at these ideologies that were there. The first ideology was a good one. There were followers of Antipas. I call these people, I dub them Antipasists. Amen. They were Antipas followers. These Antipasists that were in the church. Antipas, according to verse 13, Jesus called him his faithful martyr. Antipas was put to death because he wouldn't deny the name of Jesus. They said to Antipas, do you not know that the whole world is against you, the Romans? Antipas says if Rome is against Antipas, then Antipas is against the world. 
And they took Antipas and they roasted him alive. But when he died that martyr's death, the saints began to chant, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And Antipas' death caused a revival in the church. Well, at the church at Pergamos, there were people there who were sold out and they followed Jesus Christ. And they didn't deny Jesus' name, nor did, did they deny his doctrine. These were good people in the church at Pergamos. The, these followers of Antipas, these Antipasists who loved the Lord Jesus and followed him with all their heart. Now, that would have been wonderful, but they weren't the only group in the church. There was another group in the church who were called the Balaamites. Verse 14 tells us, uh, I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them, that is, you tolerate, you condone, you allow a group to operate in the church that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. The doctrine of Balaam was a wicked doctrine. Praise the Lord. And uh, they tried to destroy the people of God. Uh, if you study sometimes uh, at your leisure, uh, I won't have time to just go over it because it would take too long. But Balak, the king of, the, of Moab, Balak, the son of Zippor, Balak sent for Balaam to hire him to curse the children of Israel. Balaam ran into a problem in trying to curse the children of Israel. He tried to use witchcraft and incantations. But when he sought God concerning cursing the children of Israel, he learned that he could not bless whom God has cursed. And he could not curse whom God had blessed. And God had blessed the children of Israel. And every time Balaam tried to speak a curse on God's people, the Lord stopped him. Even to the point of allowing a dumb donkey to speak to him. The Bible said that the dumb ass speaking forbode or forbid the madness of the prophet. It's maddening for any prophet to try to curse God's people. You will never prosper. Praise the Lord. Trying to curse folk, you preachers out there who agree with the Bible. You can say what you will or may. You can preach against them. You can call them crazy, call us crazy, whatever. But when people agree with God, there is a blessing that the Lord puts on people who agree with God. And while your enemies are waiting for you to starve to death, David said, he prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Praise the Lord. While they're waiting on you to go down, you're steady looking younger, feeling better. Praise the Lord. Living better, dressing better. The Lord is blessing you. Why? Because his favor is on you. Good God Almighty. Say, I can't stand it. Well, you may as well. Well, sit down then because they're going forward in God because you cannot curse whom God has blessed. But what Balaam was unable to do through witchcraft and evil incantation. He accomplished through sexual immorality. I've quoted him often, but Monaghan said in the 70s, and when he said this, everybody called him racist. And by the way, saints, a person is not a racist just because someone said they're racist. 
A person is not a racist just because they may say something that on its face sounds like they are saying something that if you investigate, you, it may actually be that they're not saying what they're saying. Don't be so quick to buy that. Because what's, what's happening today in society, people are trying to use labels yes. to keep from having discussions. That's right. That's right. So before my brother sitting right there, before I hear your point, I just label you, oh, he's a fascist or he's a, he's a racist or this guy's crazy. All right, now you may not be any of those things. But if I can stick that label on you, what it causes people to do is dismiss you. So now I don't have to, in the, in the world of ideas, I don't have to even make my point. I don't even have to prove you intellectually correct or incorrect because you are that label. That's what they're doing. So they label people. And then once you're labeled, folk won't listen to you. Do you hear what I'm saying? See, so you, you, you got to be careful of what the enemy is trying to do. Are you all with me today? Yeah. Monahan was called a racist for saying in the 70s that the gains that the African American community, he was white, Monahan, that the gains that the African American community has made through the civil rights passages and civil rights gains are threatened to be lost through immorality. Sex outside of marriage. Adultery. Fornication. It's quiet in here. Abortion. He said the gains that you have made threaten the, what you have uh, uh, is threatened by Immoral behavior. The gains that Israel made when Balaam tried to curse them, they grew. But Balaam came up with a plan that worked. And the plan was immorality. I'm going to preach. I don't know today if anybody's going to say amen, but I'm going to preach. The Bible says in Numbers 25 and 1, and Israel abode in Shittim. Now, here, Shittim is, is uh, east of the Jordan uh, River, six miles north to the Dead Sea. And uh, they were right at the promised land. Almost there. And look what happened. And the people began to commit whoredoms with the daughters of Moab. All of a sudden, the men of Israel began to enter into sexual relations with the women of that city. One writer said that perhaps what made the uh, women of uh, Moab, the Moabite women, uh, look so good was that the Israeli women had been wandering in the desert. They were all dusty and tired and walking, and here comes the pretty Moabite, wincing as she goes. Praise the Lord. Uh, a red dress. Can I get a witness? I'm, oh, oh, y'all not preaching. You're not gonna. I sound like I sound like uh, another preacher friend of mine now. Uh, friend of mine, y'all won't work with me. <laughs> Says, and they call the people. Look at this. And they call the people unto sacrifice unto their own gods through having sexual relations. They talk the men of Israel out of serving Jehovah. And those men left their religion and began to worship false gods. And the people did eat and bow down, bow down to their gods. They began to serve no gods. But like what happened to old Kaepernick. 
a good Christian man doing well in the NFL, just doing well, and met a black Muslim, a Muslim lady. The next thing, once you put something on, next thing I know, the man changed gods. He changed gods. And what she put on him was not the pages of the Quran. He changed God. When she got through with him, he wouldn't stand for the national anthem or anything else. Man, changed God. Now he's out of a job. No, I ain't following no backslider. No. No, I'm not following a man who left the God of the Bible to serve Allah. No. Praise God. No. No, I'm not with it. No. Just on that, that, that alone. You brothers, you better watch these Moabites. I'm headed somewhere. Ladies, I know I seem a little heavy handed, but you're not a Moabite woman. I don't know why you, you're not, if you're not a Moabite lady, why don't you just stand up and say, thank you. All right, now some of y'all didn't stand up. Maybe, maybe I got some more bites up in here. <laughs> you should have jumped to your feet and still be up. Yay, Lord, hallelujah, praise God. <laughs> But they joined themselves. And verse 3 says, And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled. And I'll tell you what happened. Twenty and three thousand, actually twenty-four thousand, died that day. God let the disease break out. And uh, people died. People died. People died for turning their back on the Lord. People died. But it was revealed. Are you with me? In Numbers chapter 31. That the scheme to bring the men of Israel to their knees. And to cause this death. Was it was a scheme of Balaam. Numbers 31 and verse 16 says, Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespasses against the Lord in the matter of, I told you they joined themselves to Baal of Peor, in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Balaam discovered that what he couldn't do through witchcraft, he did through immorality. We are paying a dear price in this country. For our immoral behavior. Hollywood. Oh, is in a tizzy. The biggest, the biggest, the biggest hypocrites ever. Yes, Told them Thursday night how Terry Crews had to be a black guy. If if I at 6'2, 240, and muscle bound. You could never get me to admit that somebody uh, uh, sexually assaulted me. I just wouldn't tell it. Just, I mean, I just my muscles too big. Just, oh no, I ain't no way in this world. You do. Praise the Lord. I, 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 you couldn't buy. It. Listen, praise the Lord. I just, I, I, there's no way. And I certainly wouldn't tell that I, I, if I was that man and I was. Uh, in his shoes and I'm at a party and my wife is standing right there beside me that a man can walk up to me and grab me uh, in my family. Right. No way. Amen. <laughs> and, uh, and that man not getting knocked down, knocked out, stoned. I do that, you can't see me. 
All of them. The people's elbow. All of them. All those moves. Yeah. But me and my wife, we just went home and then say the reason I didn't turn it in is because I, I, I wouldn't be able to work in this city anymore. Well, if that's the case, you weren't assaulted. Uh, and to the ladies, if, if the casting couch is what you participated in to get the part, it was an arrangement. It was a deal. It was a transaction. Uh, these women, they, they were assaulted. They were just trying to have careers. Well, well walk away. Walk away. I, I, I don't defend Harvey Levin. I don't care if they put him under the, under the jail for a hundred years. But the point is, they know all this stuff been going, have been going on. Boys being raped. My assumption was all of them were doing it. It's a wicked town. And uh, it's an immoral town. And saints, we've got to go back to the biblical understanding of morals. Too many are going along with the world. There were people in the church at Pergamum who held the doctrine of Balaam. And see, these Balaamites, they wouldn't live right and they weren't going to let anybody else live right either. See, the Balaamites were persuaders. See, that's what Balaam did. He found a way to persuade them to go wrong. Balaamites are persuaders. Preach with them. And so now you got the Balaamites and the Antipasses in the church at Pergamum. You're talking about clashing. Because you got one group that says, I'm going to live holy no matter what. Then you got another group that says, well, it don't take all that. But there were a third group. This third group was called the Nicolaitans. His founder was said to be Nicholas, one of the first deacons, the deacon that was not a Jew, the Gentile deacon that Acts tells us about. The Nicolaitans were those who believed that it was all right to participate in the sinful practices of Ephesian and Asian society. They were the ultimate, some of the first once saved, always saved crowd. Praise the Lord. They were among those who long before the Baptist said it. It don't take all that. You, you, you can do this, 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 and this and still be saved. And so the society accepted the uh, Nicolaitans. Now Jesus said something about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Every time he mentioned it, as mentioned twice in, in Revelation chapter 1 and 2, in chapter 2, he says, I hate it. He says, I hate the doctrine that caused Christians to think that uh, they, praise the Lord, can be less Christian and more like the world and everything is still all right. Now, I want to say this because I don't, I don't believe that in church, because I'm, I'm, I'm walking heavy and I'm just killing some of your joy. You're not saying anything. But I want to say something because I'm not trying to, trying to bury our wounded. But I will say this. If the Lord has blessed you and the Lord has restored you and the Lord has given you another chance, you really ought to with humility and righteousness take advantage of that chance. Because let me tell you what's at stake. Let me, tell you, let me tell you what let me tell you what, what, what's being done for you. Yes, sir. What's being done? Yes. The church is saying we go, we want we're gonna help you. We we're gonna restore you. We'll stand by you. We want we want you to move forward. But at the same, same time, you're running the risk of those who know 
about what you're trying to help the person through, you're running the risk that they may walk away. Now, they wouldn't walk away if it were them. See, if it were them, they would want you to do for them what you're doing for this person. See, everybody wants mercy when it's them. But they want justice when it's the other guy. But I heard Jesus say, blessed are the merciful. For they shall obtain mercy. But if God gives you mercy, God gives you another chance. The Lord restores you. You ought to hit the ground running. You ought to say, thank you, Jesus. And I'm going to serve in such a manner. I'm going to walk in such humility. I'm going to conduct myself in such a manner that the whole body of Christ will rejoice in time to come that I got a second chance because I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm not going to make the church sad that they gave me another chance. By doing the same thing That's right. again. That's right. You don't hear my preaching today. Because I don't want you to think that, that my, where I'm headed is well to throw people away. That's not where I'm headed. But I'm, I'm trying to preach to you the Bible as it is. God is a healer. God is a deliverer. But you, but you know what? You ought to recognize that God gave me another chance. He didn't have to do it, but he did. I know of other folk that he didn't give another chance. I know of people who got just thrown away, but God gave me another chance. Lord have mercy. I'm going to make the best of this. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to live it. I'm going to live it. I'm going to live it because he gave me a second chance. Because the truth is, he's given everybody a second chance. Oh! There's nobody in here that the Lord hadn't restored since you've been saved. Now your fault might not have been someone else's fault, but you fell. How do I know you fell? The Bible says so. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, but though he fell, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Where's good preaching? But you ought to be glad. Your family gave you another chance. You ought to be glad. Your, your wife gave you another chance. You ought to be glad. Your husband gave you another chance. You ought to be glad. You ought to be determined. Because you did this for me, I'll never take you through this again. Can I get a witness? You got to know how to be restored and be humble. Be humble with it. Don't, don't be arrogant. Flighty. One preacher told people, well, just get over it. If, you, if you're the committer of the crime, you can't tell somebody to get over it. That's not for you to say. You might be able to bring someone else in and let them say that, but you can't say it because you caused the problem. And then at the same time, you got to get over certain things. Because forgiveness means moving on. A decision to forgive is a decision to move on. You can't forgive and stay there forever. Forty years later, you're bringing it up. Holding your great, great grandchild. Yeah. <laughs> when we were teenagers. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. Am I preaching good? So, uh, you had the, praise the Lord, Balaamites there. You had the Nicolaitans there. And you had the followers of Antipas. In our Lord's remedy, our Lord uses a word 
that has at its basis freedom. A word whose primary meaning, meaning is freedom. This word that has at its basis, as its base meaning freedom, describes an act that is absolutely necessary before healing can take place. God can't heal you. God can't forgive you without exercising this word that has at its basis freedom. It's wonderful to know that God has provided for us real freedom. Isn't it wonderful to know that our God is so secure in his own character that he is able to allow freedom around him. God could have made us robots. It's amazing to know that not even the mighty will of God his will does not force obedience. Even the convicting power of the Holy Ghost with his persuasive love still does not violate our freedom. And this word that has freedom at its basis it's also a word that carries enormous consequence. What is the word that has at its basis this freedom that I'm talking about? The word is right before your eyes in verse 16. The word is repent. At the basis of repentance is freedom. Or you have the freedom to repent. Or the freedom not to. It's up to you. Repentance is not force. Good God. To repent. Oh, I'm preaching. It's a change direction. It's a change of heart. It's a change of action. Repent. Repentance is is, uh, it is repent is to uh, look back and it's regret accompanied praise the Lord with a change yeah. See, some of us hadn't really repented because we don't regret what we've done yeah. until there's regret there will be no true change until it bothers you till you hate what you did to that loved one Till you hate what you said to that person. Ah, see, not, not just because you got away, but you got to look back on it. There ought to be a little, praise the Lord, retrospection. Looking back and viewing past events and viewing your behavior and say, God, I'm sorry for what I did. Mm -hmm. not, not quickly, let's just move on. But when you move on too quickly and, you, and there's no regret and there's no retrospection then it's more likely than not that the same thing will happen again. Can I get a witness? Oh my. Praise the Lord. He said repent. Change. Jesus doesn't force repentance. He preached repentance. It's up, to you, up, it's up to you and up to me whether we repent or not. The members of the church at Pergamos had the freedom to repent or not to repent. What is evident is that either choice carried consequences. There, you can control your actions, but you can't control always the consequences. See, some things, some of these Pandora boxes will open up a chain of events that not even you can control. That you don't have enough wisdom, knowledge, connections, and power to keep the lid on it. This is why you got to be careful with what you do. Oh Lord, I had the Lord say to them, repent. 
Let's deal with the consequences of uh, repenting or failure to repent. Let's look at failure first. Rocky, I'm almost ready to take off. Failure to repent, Jesus says, if you don't do it, else I will come unto thee, and, and it won't take long, I'll come quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He said, if the Balaamites and the Nicolaitans don't get right, they're going to think that they're fighting the devil. They're going to think that they're fighting demons. They're going to think that they're fighting imps. But instead, they're fighting me. You're fighting my word. See, some of us, we're not in a fight with the devil. We're in a fight with God. Because we won't repent. You're rebuking the devil, but it's not the devil, it's the Lord. The reason you don't have peace is not the devil, it's the Lord. The reason you won't get well is not the devil, it's the Lord. What is God trying to do? He's trying to save him. Trying to get you to see that if you don't stop, you're going to destroy yourself. So he will send his word and the word itself uh, will begin to fight against you. Now we're familiar with the Bible saying he sent his word and he healed them. Well, I'm showing you where he sent his word and he kicked their behind because they would not repent. Saints, my arms, your arms, our arms are too short to box with God. So it's best to get right and get right right now. You ought to lift your hands and say, Lord, I surrender. Good God Almighty, I'm just like the songwriter who said, get it right with God and get it right right now. Right down at the cross where Jesus shed his blood. Get it right with God. Get it right, get it right with God. Say yeah. Yes, Lord. America, you're in trouble because you picked the fight with the wrong one. Not even the mighty United States of America can box with God. You can't. You can't abort babies. You can't endorse homosexuality. You can't deck the White House out in homosexual colors like Obama did. You cannot endorse wickedness. You cannot legislate immorality and not get in trouble with the true and living God. But I'm glad that the Lord did not condemn the Antipas people. He didn't fight against them. And if you're living holy, I want you to know that there's another blessing on the way because he's not fighting you, but you have favor. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, I have favor working for me. Oh, 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 Lord. Somebody say favor, favor, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me, ah, now, nah. but I heard Jesus say, he said now to him that overcome. I love the word overcome. To the, he's talking now to the Nicolaitans and the Balaamites. Mm -hmm. He said, if you manage to put it behind you, oh Lord. Before I get there, there was one other thing, one other thing that he said about freedom. 
Another great word of freedom was when he said, he that hath an ear, let him hear. You see, regardless of a, tr of a, of a truth, of a great fact, regardless of a truth, of a great fact, it cannot become our truth until we are able and willing to hear and receive it. It can be true, but if you won't hear it, it won't be yours. It can't benefit you. So Jesus said, amongst the Balaamites and amongst the Nicolaitans, whichever one of you have ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And I want to tell you that if you manage to put it behind you, shake somebody's hands and put it behind you. See, this, this whole message, this whole message is good news. Because if it's too late, and if God's past judgment, he wouldn't be preaching, put it behind you. It won't matter then. So it's got to be good news. If you just, if you just put it behind you. He, he that put it behind them. Number one, I will give them hidden manna. Can I get a witness? Jesus said concerning this hidden manna mysterious food John 4 and 32 Jesus said I have meat that you know not of God's got food that you can't find at Kroger Harris Teeter North Food Line oh Lord you see when he mentioned this hidden manna it was a reminiscent to the Old Testament and the ark of the covenant of the Lord if you read Exodus 16 33 through 34 in Hebrews 9 and 4 you'll see what God told them to put manna to take a pot and put a, a omer of full of manna in the in the covenant and that it would be there for generations see this manna was placed in there and uh, I heard David when he talked about uh, the manner he said in Psalm 78 and 25 man did eat angels food good God almighty God is able to send you food of another supply I heard of another source excuse me and in the New Testament hear me out here John, praise the Lord, the 4 and 34, Jesus said unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work. John 6 and 27, Jesus says, labor not for that meat which perisheth, but for that which, for that meat which endureth to everlasting life which the son shall give to you for him have God the father sealed there is a food that you can't find at Golden Corral there is a food that Ruth Chris doesn't serve brother Uda there is a food that God will give you that will give you the nourishment that you need to get through these lonely hours mother I know you miss your daughter but there is a diet that God has for you good God almighty all you got to do is just hold to his hand he knows how to come in in the midnight hour and feed you with a nourishment that's like unlike anything that the world has ever seen you can't buy it you can't find it it's not on the shelf one writer called it mysterious food it's a secret diet that God has for the saints of God and when you're going through and it seems like you're running out of gas when you're going through and you feel like you're tired and you feel like giving up God the Holy Ghost will give you this mystery shake this mystery Twinkie this mystery piece of cornbread this mystery piece of collard greens that can come only from the Lord that will revive 
your soul and he'll give you power in the midst of the storm to keep on keeping on do I have anybody in here who have tasted the hidden manna yeah if he's giving you hidden manna shake three people's hand and say I've had some I've had some And when I ate it, it revived my soul again. I need about 10 people to just leap up and down and thank the Lord. Hidden manna. Divine nutrition. And uh, with hidden manna, another one, he says, I'm going to give you the second generous offer. If you just come out of sin, Nicolaitans. If you just come out, Balaamite. If you just come out of a doctrine that's going to cause you to go to hell. And not only do I have heaven for you, but I have hidden manna. And I have something else for you. I have a white stone. Uh, this second one. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with nutrition. But Brother Johnson, it has something to do with personal identity. Mm -hmm. In the Roman world, good God, the white stone was the symbol of legal trials. Academic grading. An academic grading system. And uh, the athletic games. The stone with the Roman letters SP imprinted in them was given at the Roman games as an award for valor. So the white stone was a trophy. The white stone was a symbol of superiority. The white stone meant that you were the best of the best. The white stone symbolized elite status. God said, if you come out of this thing, I'll give you a white stone, which means it symbolized that you won. Instead of letting that sin destroy you, you came out in time to get a trophy. You came out in time to get a legal judgment from the Lord. And God stamped you innocent and free. You came out in time to be called a saint of valor because the devil thought he had you. The devil thought he had destroyed you. That man thought you couldn't do without that immorality. That woman thought you couldn't live without it. But you came out and the Lord raised you up and you can stand up and say, I've been there, I've done that, and now I got a white stone. I got the trophy. Somebody shout some victory if God has given you a white stone. Everybody with a white stone, just give him praise. If you know that the Lord has given you a white stone, you ought to, you ought to just, just leap up and down and shout, I won, I won, I won, I won, I won, I won. I won. I won. I won. The devil thought he had me. But I got away, yeah, oh Lord, Woo! Give us some shout music. Have 
anybody else in here who can say he had a grip on me, but the loss brought me out. I was down, but he saved me. I was lost, but he found me. I fell, but he picked me up and gave me, and gave me a white stone. stone is a I got a way trophy the white stone is a testimony that the devil was sure that I'd be destroyed but look at me God raised me up Lift your hand and say yeah. Lift your hand and say yeah. Lift your hand and say yeah. Ah yeah. Ah yeah. Oh yeah. You say, I got away and he made me a preacher. I got away and he made me a missionary. I got away and he made me somebody. I got away and he raised me up. How many can testify? Ah, I got away. don't even deserve it I don't even deserve it but I got away see because I put it away and then the last one my time is up the last one is a new name <laughs> when in Roman times, when somebody had a bad, a bad illness, and uh, they recovered from that illness, mm, the illness was bad enough to kill them. But God had mercy. Uh, oftentimes, they would give them a new name. The new name means you're totally disassociated with whatever that thing was in the past. I want to know today, is there anybody here who just based on the way you're living now, based on what God has brought you from, based on the way you're carrying yourself. Is there anybody here who's totally disassociated with the way you used to live and you, you're walking in your spiritual new name? If you have a new name, you ought to praise the Lord right now for your new name. That's the way I used to be. But I ain't like that no more. Yes, I did that, but I'm not doing that anymore. Yes, I was there, but the Lord brought me out. I have a new name. A new name. 
a new name. Hence, the title of the sermon, God's Generous Offer for Coming Out of Balaamism. For Leaving the Nicolaitan Lifestyle Behind. From deciding you ain't going to stay in sin and be a player and, 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 and do that. God says, I have mysterious food, hidden manna. I have, hallelujah, woo, I got food and a stone and a new name. I mean, you're talking about the Lord just doing everything. Oh, good God. Back in the day, there was a song that was very popular that says, Jesus didn't only make over me. Keith Pringle. Jesus made me over. See, everybody can get a makeover. A new haircut. New lipstick. New outfit. And they walk out on the show and people just, ah, look at him. Woo. Ask the husband, how do you feel about your wife? He, wow, she looks beautiful. Makeover. But the truth is, same person. If they were negative when they went in to get the makeover, they're standing there on the stage smiling, still negative, because they have a makeover. God says, I'm not offering a makeover. I want to make you over. I want to work from the inside out. Not from the outside in. It's a generous offer. It's a generous offer. Compare the two. Your options. If you don't accept it, he fights against you with his word. If you do accept it, he changes your life. Gives you power to totally disassociate. They'll look at you and say, when you tell them where the Lord brought you from, they'll look at you and say, I can't see it. I don't even believe you did that. I don't believe you were capable. Oh, yes. But he made me over. He gave me a new name. He gave me a white stone. He gave me hidden manna I want to pray I want to pray but I want to pray differently today because I really want you to get delivered and I don't want your pride to be a problem pastoring now so I want you to be delivered but I don't want your pride to be a problem because there's some of us our pride going to take us to hell. Just, just won't, just, you know. Well, I can't move because of my position. You did what you did with that position. It, it, it's amazing what positions don't prevent and what they allow. But today... God is offering us something that, listen to me now, that you cannot afford to turn down. You can't afford to turn down this down. If you think that this is just another service, it's not just another sermon, I'm just talking, disregard it. I'll be meeting with you. But I'll tell you then, it's too late. Because God's fighting against you now. You got, you, you got, you got, a, whole, you got a whole new battle, you know. Listen, <laughs> David told the Lord, said, look, you deal with me. You chasing me. You correct me. Let God correct you. I want everyone to stand on their feet.
If you know. That there's. You've been part of them Balaamites. Nicolaitans. God knows. I described the, the religions. I've, I spent much time on them. And, and not, not just in this sermon. That's, right. That's why I had to come to church. Right. I preach so much. I don't have so much time. I can't we go in depth and uh, we put it out there. The Lord is saying, come to me. God is saying, really, time's up. It's a, time, it's a time of visitation. I hear this just like I heard the Lord first of the year. The Lord told me the first of the year that this year will be a year of harvesting. So I would take people home. We've had a lot of deaths. Amen. Now I thank God the overwhelming majority of the ones we've had here, people have gone to heaven. I'm so glad about that. Some were soldiers of the cross who wore out for Jesus. Some were soldiers of the cross whom the Lord took home way sooner than we thought. So you don't know who, praise the Lord, will be next. We're in November now. Praise the Lord. If you are here, see, people are beginning to come down without me calling. I was going to pray, just pray for everybody because, you know, you just pray one prayer. Because I don't want, I don't want you to miss this. But I won't prevent you from coming to the altar. If you want to come, come on. So I don't care what anybody thinks. I want to be right with God. I, I don't have, I, I, I can't afford, I can't afford pride. Can't afford pride. Good to see you, though. I try, you know, I tried to call you. Good to see you. Bless your heart. Let me shake your hand. I'm just so glad to see you. I love you so much. I'm so glad to see you. God is so good. God is so good. Come to the altar. Glory to God. Look at the people. God is serious. But now remember, this, this is not negative. This is not negative. Something. It's a generous offer. I know someone the other day, they got an offer on property that might total up to, I don't know, quite a few hundred thousand dollars in the the value of the property. They got offered multiple millions for the property. Ain't nothing left to do but shout and sell it as fast as you can. It's a generous offer. That's a God thing. Today, we're getting a generous offer. Hidden manna. White stone. A new name. The writer said that the good news was that even though the members of the church at Pergamos had drifted into sin, the good news was that their lives did not have to, have to be characterized that way forever. That he offered them an a out that would disassociate them from their worst low. Amen. Isn't that something? Hallelujah. Isn't it good to know yes. that God is so good that he will say, you know what? I will, son, give you an opportunity to be totally disconnected from the failures of your past. And I'll give you food that will give you the energy you need to forge a new future. Hallelujah. And as you gain victories, I'll give you something to symbolize it. I'll give you a white stone. I'll put it in your hand. Woo! 
Oh God. Lord, I thank you. Begin to thank him right now. Begin to thank him. Begin to thank him. Begin to thank him. Some of you need to be on the altar because of your reactions. You cuss like sailors. See, life is 10% what happens to you, but 90% how you respond. You don't like my talk. I'm getting ready to pray. People see the wrong of others, but they don't see theirs. Praise God. Let God give you hidden manna, a white stone, and a new name. Dear Lord Jesus, we stand before you <clears throat> right now. We Every person on this altar knows what their particular situation is. We are too wise to infer that or assume that we know why anybody's on this altar. And besides, what does it matter? Because we're not God. We don't have hidden manner. We don't have a white stone, and we certainly do not have a new name to give anybody. So, Lord, we come. We come. We repent of our sins. Tell God on your own. You have the freedom not to tell him, but you ought to exercise the wisdom to do so. Tell God I'm sorry. Lord, I regret, I regret past behavior. I, I regret what I did in the past. I, I regret, I regret. I don't, I don't look back on it with fond memories. Don't look back on it with joy or glee. Don't look back longing for but God, we regret. And oh, Father, right now, we change our minds. Good God Almighty. Change our actions. Change our behavior. Change. See, this is the change you can live with. Change my mind. Change my actions. Change. I behave. I regret, I regret, I regret that stuff. I, I regret drinking. I regret smoking. I regret gang banging. I regret the abortion. I regret lying. I regret fornication. I regret adultery. I regret homosexuality. I regret being hateful and mean and spiteful. I regret Using foul language, I regret, I regret, I regret it, I regret it. I repent from, I turn from it. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I can't change it, I can't do anything about it, but I do regret it. And I re repent from it. And I ask you, oh God, right now, for hidden manna, feed me till I won't no more. Here's my cup, Lord. Fill it up and make me whole. Oh, Jesus, need your hidden man. Need your divine nutrition in the name of Jesus. Need you to strengthen me right now. Give me strength from, from a journey. You gave the prophet Elijah hidden manna. For when he ate some food, he went 200 miles in the strength of one meal on foot. That's not humanly possible unless you give divine manna. 
Oh Lord, we need your nutrition. We need your help. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, do it right now. Do it right now. Do it right now. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Give me the strength I need to walk out of it. Give me the strength I need to leave it behind. Give me the strength I need to be the person you'd have me to be. Somebody ought to help me pray. Give me the strength I need to overcome. Give me the strength I need. Yes, Lord. I eat your hidden manna, hidden manna, as we obey, hidden manna, as we go forth, hidden manna, in the name of Jesus, and I thank you right now, I thank you right now, I thank you right now, for my legal verdict, I thank you right now, for my trophy, I thank you right now, for my white stone, Thank you, Jesus. I'm on my way. I got a white stone uh, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to cleave to the old ragged cross. I'm going to cling to the old ragged cross. The cross, my white stone uh, in the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And I savor all ties with the past I change in the name of Jesus my identity thank you Lord for my new name thank you Lord for my new name I'm not the way I used to be I'm not what I was hallelujah I'm a brand new me I'm a brand new me I may look the same carry the same old name but I'm a brand new me I'm a brand new me because Jesus changed me this morning Jesus changed me this day and I'm going to take advantage of it yes Lord we're having an old fashioned prayer me Jesus here we are ah, Jesus here we are I don't go there no more I don't live like that anymore the Lord has broken the chains he delivered my soul I got a new name I got a new name I got a new name yes Lord somebody get your breakthrough somebody get your breakthrough yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. Free. No more chain holding me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody help me. Lord, I accept it. Lord, I believe it. Lord, I rejoice in it. Lord, I say yes. Yes to your will. Yes to your way. Yes to your word. I got my trophy. I got my new name. Yeah. Got my hidden manner. Yes, Lord. I just heard something. And when you stand praying, forgive. against any for if you do not forgive men 
their trespasses against you. The heavenly Father will not forgive your trespasses against him. Lift your hands for there's somebody in here for this to really be complete. It may be your husband. It may be your wife. It may be a mistress. It may be a drug dealer. It may be a friend. It may be a family member. It may be, oh my, the possibilities are many. But I hear the Lord say, lift your hands. As a symbol of forgiveness, clench your fists. Clench your fists. Now, open your hands and let go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. I forgive my mama. I forgive my daddy. It's popular now to hold something against people for what they did for you went to you when you were three. I forgive them. I let it go. I let it go. There's no benefit in carrying it. Whether you believe that O.J. Simpson killed, what was the young guy's name? Brown, Ronald Goldman, or not? Or Nicole? Isn't it amazing He's been to jail in all kind of trouble. But when they show him on the news and show his face, no wrinkles anyway, acting the pure fool versus when they show Ronald Goldman's father and the Browns, you see how they're aging. They're aging. Now, you know what's killing them? They refuse yes. to let it go. Yes. It would benefit them. It won't, it won't. God got to deal with him. But it would benefit them. It would slow down the aging process. They would sleep better. They would look better. They would enjoy life better. It's bad when you got to, when you got to, uh, carry, you taking a position where you got to be mad all the time. You got to be resentful all the time. You got to be a victim all the time. When they, when they show the camera, whether you're upset or not, you got to get upset. Oh no, you can't live like that. That's death. I wouldn't give him that. You shouldn't give anybody that. Let it go. God will fix things in the end. Amen. In the end, we win.